William, yes. I want you to think back to your life and the world around you in 2001. I'm going to give you some nudges. Okay. Biggest movies. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I'm sorry. Stop. That's the wrong name. Sorcerer's Stone is what it was released in America. Philosopher's Stone in Australia. They don't know what philosophers are. Shrek. Okay. I R- Rush that. Hour 2. Yeah, all right. That was box office smash. <laughs> the Mummy Returns. Yeah, well, that was good fun. That, that was, was good fun. fun. I, am a, I am a big fan of a rollick in the desert. Of, of the mummies. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, like if I was being chased by any sort of supernatural bad guy, I don't want to be chased by a mummy, but you, you know you would tell the story later. If you survive, would yeah, you become one? How about sci-fi? So Donnie Darko. Oh, out that, yeah? oh, yeah. Planet of the Apes, the one with Marky Mark, you know, the big one. The reboot. That really went the off. first reboot. Yeah. How about music? Let's Because we're getting into 2001. System of a Down released Toxicity. Fuck yeah, they did. All right. Tool released Lateralis. Nice. I know. The Aria top five songs in Australia. Can't Fight the Moonlight by Leanne Rhymes. We all remember that, Blinder. It Wasn't Me by Shaggy. The one I do remember. Can't get you out of my head, Kylie Minogue. Mm-hmm. We all know the la, 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 yeah, yeah. la, la, la. So that's what's going on. What a great rendition you give the audience here. I know. I'm y- like y- a, you, you are a gift to musicology just I'm, for this audience yeah, right Leonard here. Cohen learnt, learnt sing from me. Oh, my God. Uh, so events, 9-11, of course. That did happen. That was a big one. In, in 2001. It did. iTunes launched and also the first iPod. And I remember the first iPod. I bought one in Honolulu and I was in my hotel room going, I just want to lick it. I couldn't believe that because of the touch Why is screen. that a response to – Because it was just so lickable. The technology was just delicious. That's not nice. It wasn't. <laughs> first draft of the Human Genome Project. First clone of a human embryo. This is what's going on in 2001. Um, the heady days in Australia, John Howard, PM. Okay. Fuck yeah. Ansett Australia goes belly up. Do you remember Ansett? I do. I do. They're one of the oldest airlines in the world and the second largest in Australia, which is not a big claim to fame. So that's what was going on. So think about it. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in, the in the zone. zone? I'm, I'm in, in the 2001, 2001 zone. You're feeling it? Do you, do you notice anything? Like you're feeling any nostalgia? No. Feeling any wistfulness? No. Do you feel your shoulders relax? Uh, <laughs> Is your heartbeat slowing down? <laughs> it, was, it was relaxed before. What about younger? Do you feel any younger? Am I imagining myself in 2001? Yes, I am younger. I am, I am 22 years younger. And you can feel that? No, not really. Why not? Why would I suggest this? I don't know. What are you're, we talking about? You're the one suggesting it. So what if I told you that um, to turn back your age-related decline could be as simple as living exactly as you did when you were, for example, 22 years younger? And when I mean living, I mean 100% committing. Welcome to The Wholesome Show, the podcast that pines. No. I'm not, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, no. What? No. Sorry, listener, I'm not reading that 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 <laughs> thing that, that Rod just wrote. It's totally on topic. I never thought you'd reach the limit. I've, I've done well. I don't know why that's a thing. What it actually says was the podcast that pines for the youthful days of the whole of science. Yeah, there you go. As with, if. With a W. Because it's not naughty. He tried to entrap me into I did. <laughs> into, into into saying something dreadful. that uh, is dreadful and, and entirely uh, on topic. You know, you can't get me. Oh, and I'm Rod Lamberts, the the bad man. Ellen Langer was born in the Bronx, 1947. Um, she went to NYU, chemistry major, wanted to do medicine. Mm-hmm. Very excited about medicine. Then she took Psych 101, and apparently, the way the lecture presented human psychology, she was like, "This is." This is cool as fuck. Way more interesting. Than Brains chemistry. opened up. She doesn't. She doesn't Little care mind. about medicine anymore. She wants brain medicine. She did. She did. And also, it probably helped that her professor at the time was Philip Zimbardo. Okay. The stage show magician looking dude uh, responsible for the Stanford prison experience. Look, I think most most psychologists look like a stage show magician in the seventies. He won that when I, they lined them up and said, "Who looks most stage show magician?" He was wearing the velvet cloak. He had the the look. So she did a graduate work at Yale. So she was doing um she's playing poker. And that got her thinking about her doctoral dissertation. On this the, is part of her graduate work? No, or She's no, just playing poker. Just playing okay. poker, as you yeah. do, because you've got to make money. You've got to yeah, live. Yeah. And she started thinking about the magical thinking of people who are otherwise quite logical and rational, like these sort of essentially magical, irrational, crazy shit. So logical person still has a weird bit of superstition. Weird bit of superstition. And they, as she put it, um, even smart people can fall prey to illusions of control over chance events. She said, look, really, we're not very rational creatures. And, I mean, we know this. We know this. Um, her notions were basically that our cognitive biases will routinely steer us wrong and that we are trained not to think 
which means we're extremely vulnerable to notions that seem right but actually aren't. So things like believing that if you put the same numbers into the lottery every week, you increase your chances. Like it seems like I don't it think, should be I don't true. think people believe that. I they think do. the people that – no, 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 no. See, I think I the, have people a friend. That, the people that do that is once you get stuck onto a set of numbers, you would be horrified with yourself if those numbers came up and you chose different numbers. That's definitely so, true. So it's, I don't think they're thinking it's, it's more likely. They're just thinking this what is if? my only path here. Yeah, I have to do this. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's a commitment. I've told you, I had a buddy who, well, I have a buddy who was convinced that this was what happened and he said it, it's got to increase your chances and I carefully and slowly explained why and he went, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, but it's got to, doesn't it? And I thought, all right. He was, he was convinced also that it would increase his see, chances. See, I think I would be down on the person that always puts in the same numbers because I, I just would be horrified. If I had a-, a Horrified? Well, like, I'd, I'd be horrified ah! if, I had, if I had my set of numbers coming up on the day yeah. when I was like, oh, today's the day to be flippant. And it's- Ooh. Yeah. No, I agree, but I agree. I can imagine you get yourself stuck in it, but what if? What if this is the day? Anyway, she was kind of intrigued by this, but she was a bit sort of undiagnosed ADHD-ish, so she she wasn't the kind of person to plug away at one idea. So you can't just you can't just add a diagnosis here. Undiagnosed. Yeah, okay. You See, can't, it wasn't you a can't add, add an undiagnosed, undiagnosed diagnosed. Undiagnosed. She was – how did she put it? I don't know. She was a gadfly. She'd bounce around between things as they All took right. her interest. So she had. she says, I have so many ideas. If whatever it is I'm excited about now doesn't happen, it doesn't matter because there's always the next possibility. So oh. it's just like, yeah, 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 ideas. Cool. So in the 1980s, she became the first woman to be a, uh, a tenured professor in psychology at Harvard. Only in the 1980s. Yeah, imagine that. Oh, wow. It's as if it used to be a boys club yeah. <laughs> back in the old days. And so she studied things like illusion of control, decision-making, aging, and mindfulness theory. Mm. But it's enough background, so – Let's get into a bit more detail. In the 1970s, she became convinced that not only are people led astray by their biases, but they are spectacularly inattentive to what's going on around them. Like, we are just not there. We're not present. We don't pay attention to stuff. And she goes on, to, yeah, I know, you're going like, isn't that just being alive? Yeah, I, I thought I so. Yeah. She said, um, when you're, and we're not there, when you're not present, you're very likely to end up just going where you're led, be that directly or implicitly. So she sets up all these cunning studies to show how people's thinking and behavior can be easily manipulated with very subtle primes. And one of them, there'll be many more, don't worry, but one of them in the early days was she and her colleagues wrote these outrageous, ridiculous interdepartmental memos. Yeah. And they just tweaked how much they looked like a real interdepartmental memo. We're talking 70s, not email. Oh, okay. And people would comply with ridiculous shit if it looked official. Oh, they okay. So fake, didn't a, really process fake it. a memo and yep. it says throw out all of your work. Yep. The question is, though, what's this got to do with winding back the clock? and anti-aging and, you know, going to the youthful part of science or wherever yeah. else you want. So here's the premise. We act like we're supposed to act or the situation suggests it will, even if it's implicit, like we tend to act as things dictate is what she's saying. So what sense. are we saying? So society has but, context? <laughs> but she goes deeper. Okay. She goes deeper. All right. I feel like you're, you're not on board with Ellen yet. The idea, she says, that getting old means we get frail and forgetful and it's so embedded in our culture and our understanding of aging that the expectation and living up to the expectation, implicit and otherwise, is hard to tease apart from the actual biology of aging. Okay. That's her argument. Okay. Okay. So the expectation is so strong, this is what old So us like. getting frail yep. is in part uh, body and in part head. Because you're supposed to. And, oh, yeah, okay. Fair enough. And she says, for example, like if you're living in a nursing home, your meals are often in a cafeteria, your recreation is at scheduled times, you're surrounded by other old people, most of them are strangers, you've probably been robbed by, of a lot of your autonomy, mm -hmm. maybe – bits of your identity. And so the things that make you are very much tied much more to your past and the present and nobody really expects a lot of you. So at whatever age, but particularly in, in old people's places, it's not an environment in which people thrive. They yeah. tend to kind of just yeah, do, yeah, yeah. do the things yeah. they're supposed there's to a, do. There's a path in front of you and it just gets closer to the grave. Yeah. Okay. And she basically says in, a, in an article, she wrote in a, a chapter rather, old age, an artifact, question mark, 1981. Social conditions may foster what may erroneously appear to be a necessary consequence of aging. Okay. So you see where it's going. Yeah, okay. So she, she did a seminal study on pot plants and people. What? You know the one. Oh my, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't know the one. So as a, a classic of social psychology, she gave houseplants to two groups of nursing home residents. Yeah. One group, she said, you're responsible for keeping the plant alive. And also you can make choices about your daily schedules, but the plant was for some reason- You've got to keep it alive. You've got to yeah. keep it alive. We're not going to do it for the you. The other group, you're responsible for killing it. Yep. The other group murdered their other people's pet. Uh, what? Plant. Really? No. no. So the other group just were told the staff would take care of the plants and they didn't have any change in I schedule. So it's yeah. just like, here's a plant, but it's not really yours. 
18 months later, twice as many people who were caring for the plants and making more decisions were alive than in the control group. Alive. 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, but they're stressed. Like they're, they're, the no, other group- the, the, other kept, group, the stress kept them going because it had to- <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The other group just relaxed into the yeah, grave. Yeah, fuck it. Whereas these guys, they got pressure now. i got a plant. you got to keep this plant alive. Yeah. And they're like, fuck, the researcher will be disappointed in me if I, do, if I just die. <laughs> Why are you staying alive? I don't want to let her down. So she thought, this is a good result. This is interesting. What if we could put people in a psychologically better setting that would, and then they'd associate it with a better, younger version of themselves? Might their bodies follow along? I thought this was going to be about give them a job or give them a- Work harder. Yeah, exactly. So what if we put people back at work- Pull this plow. And say, you are now responsible for Carry this. these bags of grain, you exactly. old lazy bastard. <laughs> you malingering son of a bitch. So she said, basically, wherever you put your mind, you're necessarily going to be putting your body. That's her call. So the question for her became how many of aging's negative effects could be manipulated and maybe even erased oh my God. by psychological intervention. Oh, oh, wow. So how do you test this? Do an experiment on people. Yeah, okay. Obviously. So she couldn't actually send – this, this is a quote from one of the articles. She couldn't actually send elderly people into the past. I don't know if you knew that, but mm. she didn't have that power then. So she thought, let's bring the past into the present. We're going to – this is 1981. We'll recreate the world of 1959. Yes. Truman Show, not How precisely? What are they doing here? Quite a bit, actually. And I'll ask the subjects to live, and the subjects back then still, as though they were 20 years, or really 22 years earlier. And she wrote about this later in 2009 in a book called Counterclockwise. So 1981, the experimental group, eight men in their 70s. So before getting there, they had assessments of dexterity, grip strength, flexibility, hearing, vision, memory and cognition, which was closest sort of indicators of, or biomarkers of age yeah, at yeah. the time. Yeah, checking how well they are. Yeah, quite reasonable. They then got off the van, they shuffled into the room. Some of them were, as they put it, arthritically stooped. A couple had canes okay. to walk with, not mm-hmm. candy. Um, but but, but they, they walked in? They did walk in. Okay. They, they, no, none were wheeled in or, yeah. or stretched in right. on IVs or anything. They, were, they could independently move even if some of them a bit slowly yeah, and okay. with care. So as they get through the door, they could hear Perry Como music creating through an, a vintage radio, Ed Sullivan on TV in black oh and white. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> everything inside, books on the shelves, magazines, everything were basically from 1959. That's so cool. Yeah, they went for it. And from the moment they walked through the door, they were treated as if they were younger. So they were told not to just reminisce about this era, but to inhabit it. And she goes on to say to them, we have good reason to believe that if you are successful at this, you will feel as you did in 1959. Oh. They were told they had to take their own belongings upstairs, even if they had to do it one shirt at a time, but you guys are going to take your own yeah, gear yeah, up yeah, there. Yeah, so you've got to do it. Each day they'd discuss the sport of the time, like from 1959, current events like the first US satellite. They would discuss movies that they just watched like Anatomy of a Murder with Jimmy Stewart. They spoke about 1950s artifacts around the place and all these events in the present tense. I don't know if there were people marching around going, how dare you say was, I'm going to bash you. That wasn't made clear. So how many years back was this? So this was 22 years. 22. 22 right. years. There were no mirrors, no modern day clothing, no photos except portraits of their younger selves. Why did they choose 22 years? I don't know. I wondered that too. I'm like 22. But these are all older folks. 70s. 70s. So going back to your 50s, it's not necessarily their glory days. No. So if they're they're 17 in 1981, you could have gone back to uh, 1930 or something. Okay, that sucks. It's the Depression. (laughs) That's it. Uh, but I feel young. Let's, let's go, let's go to a, <laughs> an era where they felt good and it's yeah. not so sucky. All right. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why they chose it. I wonder if 1959 was particularly pivotal, but that, that wasn't noted. She just had some 1959 magazines lying around. She's like, oh, well, I could recreate that bit. Perry Como we can still get. Yeah, I've got the, that. I've got the radio from 1959. Oh. <laughs> they did all this um, and they did it for five days. The control group were, arrived a little earlier in the monastery and they were encouraged to reminisce but they didn't do any of the other stuff. Different part of the monastery. Different part of the they monastery. They got no pericomo. They got the today, the 1981 version. Okay. And but they, they were encouraged ha- to reminisce. It was like, tell us about the past, talk about 1959. Did they have to carry their clothes upstairs? No, none of that. They were treated as they were today. A couple of variables here. A couple, quite a few. Results. So a week later, or five days, both, the, both groups showed improvements in physical strength, manual dexterity, gait, posture, perception, memory, cognition, taste sensitivity, hearing, and even vision. So they're all doing both a fair groups, bit better. Both groups are doing better. They were suppler. They showed greater manual dexterity. Suppler. 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 And more bendy. It's, it's, it's a, a weird way to think about our old people. Hank, <laughs> it's time to test your supple We need tea. some supple old people Let's over here. see how bendy you are, Hank. 
And they also sat taller, so they had more. Yeah, but posture. Weirdly, the weirdest thing they thought really was that their sight improved. But it was much more significant in the experimental group. 63% of them had better intelligence test scores. Um, the other guys, 44%. And they, they had better than they did when they started. So they not only got they, – they definitely improved. Four independent volunteers who knew nothing about the study were asked to look at photos before and after of the men. And on average they said they look about two years younger. Two years, man. Okay. He doesn't look 74. He looks 72. All right. It's amazing. <laughs> Last day of the study, men who, quote, had seemed so frail just days before ended up playing while they were waiting for the bus an impromptu game of touch football on the front lawn. You seem worried. No, I don't seem worried. I, I think that's I think that's really cool. Except it's wonderful. You just have to live in a weird time uh, warp where you don't get anything new. No. That's a bummer. Mm. So she took these results as confirmation of her theories of power of the mind over the body. Yeah. I guess she's very strong about this. And she wrote in 81, many of the consequences of old age may be environmentally determined and thereby potentially reversed through the manipulations of the environment. But the results sounded kind of too good. And she even said, look, it sounds like it's Lourdes, you know, the holy waters and curing ungents. She got her students to write up a, an experiment for a chapter in a book from Oxford University Press, Higher Stages of Development. But she never sent it to journals because she suspected it would be rejected. Okay. Which is why you don't send things to journals, obviously. Yeah, sure. But they might not like it. Sure. And I think they'll say, yeah. Sure, sure. They won't like it. So were there critics? Yeah, one or two. Of her whole thing. So if we go back to the pot plant study for a moment. So she published this in the uh, Journal of Personality Social Psych in 77. A year later, there was an erratum published that basically said, oh, I love this, on page 900, the Z scores should be changed to so the statistical glitches. And they said, actually – the difference is only marginally certificate, uh, significant, so a more cautious interpretation of the mortality findings than originally given is necessary. So, like, yeah, there's a difference, but not a big one. Are you sure between the pot plant? Uh, look after yourself marginally and significant is significant. Statistically, I, I, that is true. Th that's the I point. Agree. But are you, are you getting a sense here that maybe people aren't huge fans of this research because oh. they're not? Are they not? There are certain – well, here we go. So the main um, magazine article I was talking about from New York Times magazine, a guy called Bruce Grierson wrote it. He says here a number of quotes. Langer's sensibilities can feel at odds with the rigor of contemporary academia. Sometimes she'll give equal weight to casually uh, yeah, casually hatched ideas and peer-reviewed studies, seeing them as the same. All right, okay. And then this story had quite a splash. So he was interviewed about the story. He mm. became an interviewee. And he said, look, while Langer's uh, unorthodox techniques may inspire wonder, they should also provoke scepticism because she's pretty far out there on a limb with this kind of stuff. People won't be convinced until it's been replicated under strictly controlled conditions, nor should they be. Yeah, sure. That's replicate fine. it. I, look, yeah, that's I, fine. I, to be honest, I don't know why people are that bothered by this. No. I mean, to me, on face value, the idea that A, all these people get a, a new uh, a new place to live in for a few days, yep. I can imagine there's improvement straight away. You yep. know, that there's, that you're not in the same routine. And then you're asked to do one of two things to imagine them back in time or you, yep. you – it's not that surprising to me – That you feel that, better. That there would be marginal improvements. And yeah. we're, we're not talking vast improvements. No. They, they sit up straighter. They don't need glasses anymore. Their I don't know why people are back. attacking this this much. I get that uh -huh. more, more research would be a thing. I, don't, I just don't understand the, the problem with it. Take it so much. What do you mean? James Coyne, for example, he's a University of Pennsylvania psychologist and, as it was put in this article, an indefatigable – indefatigable? Indefatigable. That was going to be my newspaper. In, indefatigable. The indefatigable. And was it about – That was going to be my newspaper. If racket, I, if racket I can, sports? If, well, I don't know. I don't care. Because it sounds it'd be, like a sound effect. It'd, indefatigable. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be a great name for a newspaper that no one can pronounce. The ind, 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 indefatigable. Like my band, the Athabasca Bathyscaf. <laughs> Um, he goes further in his responses. So he says, um, he responds to the article that, that was in the New York Times mag. Some of her studies are described only in an ostensibly peer-reviewed journal. What Perspectives on psychological can, science. Can we stop there? Yeah, I know. It, it, it's peer-reviewed or it's not. And it I is. get that there are better peers. There are. So I love, it's, yeah, ostensibly. Like you can, you can kind of, you can feel the air quotes leaking through the page. Um, and he says, but there's insufficient details to allow any independent evaluation of her claims, like many, many, many studies. You yes. can't just read the article and reproduce. There's evidence of deliberate selective publication in her, in her quotes in the New York Times article. I'm like, what? She talks about ongoing studies in ways that suggest bias being introduced by her monitoring of incoming data. It's quite a, a screed here. She's flippant in presenting her theoretical model and the sources of her hypotheses. He continues. He's angry. 
There are discrepancies between claims that she makes to the media and what is available in published accounts of her research. Not qualified. Just oh, like okay. They're not quite the same. Yeah, right. She's dismissive of the basic responsibilities of a scientist conducting biomedical research. Langer has published in scientific journals, but she's not otherwise acting like a scientist. <laughs> he's, he's going off. What, what, what is actually the problem with this? The actual study she did, putting the older people into, you know, the monastery. Uh, oh, it's a small sample in short term. Sure. That was one of the main criticisms. Sure. Small sample, short term. This is my favourite. If you want to hear how this guy's being very even-handed, this proves it. If I am sceptical, do I owe it to her to carefully examine this article before dismissing it? I don't think so. Her other, her other activities establish sufficient prior probabilities it will not be worth the effort. Mm. So, fuck it. Like, seriously, calm the hell down, mate. Yeah. So, yes, the small sample and um, very short terms, um, five days, was a critique, and you can get that. Yes, it was a small sample in just a few days. There are plenty of potential confounds, as you note, but this is a criticism too. Stimulating novelty, the stimulating novelty of the setup, and people might have been trying extra hard to please the testers. Sure. My response is, but they were able to. Yeah. <laughs> like something changed from before. <sighs> but they're able to. Look, yes. This is why I find it, it just keeps going. Um, also, the unconventionality of the study made Langer self-conscious about showing it around. So now you're starting to see why maybe she went, I don't want to send it to a journal. I, I don't actually see what's that unconventional about it. No, neither do I. I think a big part of it was, and this is what she goes on to say, it was just too different from anything that was being done in the field as I understood it. Okay. She says, you have to appreciate people were not talking about mind-body medicine. This is the early 80s. Yeah. So this was just like, no, we don't talk about that. But in my head, everything they're saying, it's like, but these people behaved in ways they had not been mm. quite clearly as a result of whatever was going on. Yeah, yeah. And and so maybe it's some sort of placebo, but maybe you're getting a good- Still good, works. But yeah, yeah. You, you're Still getting works. an insight into what the placebo is yep. uh, as a as a uh, mental effect on your body. Yeah, so, yeah. So this is why I'm, I'm reading these critiques. And I'm waiting for someone to really, you know, bring the hammer down. I'm like, no, it's just, they get to bring it down. It goes, tink. Yeah. There's nothing there. So why didn't she replicate it? Because why wouldn't you? Uh, it's someone else's job. Damn you! That is you the critics. rule. That's the rule of replication. Someone else has got to do it. You can't the rule you can't the replicate law. your own work. She didn't try because it's complicated and expensive to do this. But also, every time she thought about it, she apparently talked herself out of it. So she kind of went, "I don't want it," mm. which could have been the undiagnosed gadfly syndrome. Yeah. Okay. Then in 2010, the BBC said, "We're going to do this and broadcast it. We're going to do one." Does that count as science, though? Yep. All right. That's why. When I first started studying psych, I wanted to work for a TV show or McDonald's because there are no ethics committees. I could do whatever I wanted. That's not a good thing. No, I didn't do it because I'm a good person. Yeah, okay. Uni made me better. Yeah, you're a good person. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a consultant on this show and was called The Young Ones, not the um, yeah, not that one. Six aging former celebrities were guinea pigs. They were required to turn up in period cars from 1975. So we're going back quite a while. So we're time. starting earlier. They, they, and they're yeah, going to source their own back. period cars. Maybe they all had one. That was a criterion. Do you have a car from 1975? It just so happens I do. So they had kitschy art on the walls. You know, they put it all, they did, recreated essentially the same gig, 1975. So they're going to go for a little holiday back to 1975. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I, I, I guess the other thing about this is I can absolutely get, this is a holiday effect. You know, this is, this is five yeah. days worth of, of doing something different in yep. a different location yep. and you're going to feel better. Yep. Would it last if you were stuck there for the, well, for the foreseeable future? Maybe not. Probably get a bit weird after a while when you no. want, like I want to, I want a pill Read from 1980. Newspaper? You can't have no. it. no. I don't know if they denied the medication. You're going to have 1975 medicine here. Yeah, here you go. Here's a cat in a bag and rub it on your face and you'll be fine. Um, apparently they emerged as rejuvenated as Langer's mob seemed to. They showed marked improvement. One who'd turned up in a wheelchair work, walked out with a cane. Another who couldn't even put his socks on unassisted hosted the final evening's dinner party gliding around with purpose. But that's a choice. Like I, you know, I, no. I, I want someone to help me put my socks on. That'd be quite nice. Why don't you just call me, man? <laughs> I mean, don't feel embarrassed. You, just, you can just ask. Um, others, as they put it, walked taller and seemed to look younger. And she, of course, mused that also rekindling of their egos because they became, you know, they were aging celebrities. They became central to Yeah, back when they they were a big part of the narrative. Yeah. Um, it won a BAFTA. So, Did it really? Yeah, POMI equivalent of an Emmy. Um, a four-part show. So it brought new attention to her, to her work, her original work. But all of this, again, arguing that oh, I was just because of a TV show, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, yeah, but they behaved – Better. They felt better and did more than they were doing before. 
Why would you bag that out? Well, I guess the other thing is the the level of intervention required to get this effect. Yeah. It might be too big. High-ish. Yeah. Recreate everything. And as, yeah, as we're saying, like, I want to use my phone. Oh, we don't have those today. Um, yes, that could be a problem. And would that ruin it if you could do everything, but you also took your iPhone with you? Of course it would ruin it. Ruin it. Ruined. Um, some of uh, – she has supporters, so some of her colleagues were pretty keen on it. So there's a, a psychologist called Jeffrey Reidiger. Um, he's at one of the Harvard many hospital output things. He was invited by a friend to watch the show. He hadn't really known much about the original study, but he watched the show and went, this is kind of interesting. She's one of the people at Harvard who really gets it. She gets that health and illness are much more rooted in our minds and in our hearts and how we experience ourselves in the world than our models even begin to understand. Yeah. And he's from, a, as I say, clinical, Harvard's McLean Hospital. So he's from a clinical environment. Steve Pinker, writer and Harvard professor. Yeah, okay. He told um, the author of this uh, piece, she filled an important niche within the school's department, which has often harbored, quote, mavericks with non-traditional projects, including B.F. Skinner, uh, Timothy Leary, and Richard Alpert, who ended up being called Rum Dust and becoming a serious spiritual dude. So he was kind of going, no, nah, she's cool. Mm-hmm. It's important to have people like that here, yeah, okay. et cetera, et cetera. So there are definitely strong supporters as well. So what happened after Counterclockwise? She did a few experiments, a few little things. So in 2007, hotel chambermaids. So one of her students, Alia Crum, who's now a quite a well-known or at least you know, successful psych in her own right, they took 84 hotel chambermaids. Now, mostly these women reported, and they were women, of course, because men can't clean rooms. Well, they'd be called chamber misters. Chamber mates. Chamber, chamber mates. Chamber yeah. bros. Yeah, sure. Um, they mostly reported that they didn't get much exercise in a typical week. They really? Saying, yeah, we don't get a lot of exercise. We oh, you know, around. non-exercise. Surely they're working physically a fair bit. According to them, what didn't really mean much. All right, okay. But apparently not true, but it didn't mean much. So the researchers primed the experimental group, so half of them, to think differently about their work. And they said, actually, according to serious medical science, you're not only doing quite a bit of exercise, but more than the surgeon general would daily recommend. Like See, you're, there you go. you're above. Yeah, exactly. That's you're what above. I was saying. That's you were. You're saying. like the surgeon I'm on general. on their side. You are one of the surgeons general. <laughs> So once their expectations shifted, the, the maids who had that lost weight relative to a control group. Um, they also improved on um, mass body mass index and hip-to-waist ratio when all other factors were held. What? Yeah, what? They, they actually lost more weight So, so it's just told them that You're what doing they're doing is, yeah. is exercise and, and they then went, it counts huh. more as exercise. Supposedly. <laughs> I know. So – well, uh, right. in fairness, it actually yeah, they were moving around enough to for it to count. So you can't tell uh, the sen- sedentary of us what you're doing counts as exercise. I, I don't think she tried that freaking gadfly again. Like try, <laughs> but also, or it could just be these guys were doing that anyway, and the people who were told they weren't getting a lot of exercise, it's mm. the, it's them that didn't change, so to speak. Maybe they keep themselves less fit. Yeah. Critics, of course, said, "No, nah, it's got to be statistical errors." subtle behavior changes that she'd somehow instilled in the weight loss group because otherwise the outcome would defy physics. And her response was, there's no discipline that's complete. If current physics uh, can't explain these things, maybe there are changes that need to be made in physics. I don't think it has to defy defy physics. Defies physics. I don't think it has to. You've broken the laws of the universe (laughs) with your lies. But I just like her critics from, you know, you could a physiology or or a psychology program or a medicine program saying this defies physics. Yeah, you fuck with physics. People really get stroppy with her. Mm -hmm. 2009, a couple of years later, the hair salon study. So this explores the relationship between expectations of aging and physiological signs of health which they designed, she and a couple of colleagues, around hair salons. So they had research assistants approach 47 You have to women. get a haircut from 1970s. Yes. I don't want it. You have to. I don't That's want a, it. And you, you get 1950s. You, you, I'm going to get in the 80s. I'm going to get a flock of seagulls. No, you're, you're getting depression era. You, you're only getting a haircut You're, you're getting the bowl. Yeah, the Prost. bowl and a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> English Civil War. <laughs> yeah, 47 women. They ranged from 27 to 83 years old. And they're about to have their haircuts or coloured or both. So apparently it doesn't sure. matter if it's cut or a colour. They took blood pressure readings. After their hair was done, they filled out a questionnaire about how they felt they looked and their blood pressure was taken again. The subjects who perceived themselves as looking younger after the makeover had lower blood pressure than the ones who didn't feel that they looked younger. Okay. For so, positive haircuts, lower your blood pressure. No, good haircuts. So the ones that got the haircut that made them that feel – liked it. 
they, they liked it, so they feel a bit more youthful. I look younger, and they're they're not stressed, so their blood pressure, blood pressure goes, goes down. down. The other ones that get shitty haircuts, and they're like, oh, this is horrible. Three heart attacks I, in one stroke. I, I feel terrible. I don't doubt there are people that have had a heart attack in uh, after a haircut in a salad. I'm sure there are people stressed already. And then they get a haircut that is just a tragedy. And so, what, what what finally did it? Was it work? Was it the death of your first child? No, it's my haircut. No, I, you know, Oof. 2010 flight simulator. So she and her colleagues published in Psychological Science. Two groups were were taken in to use a flight simulator. One were told to think of themselves as Air Force pilots. They were given <laughs> the flight suit gear. Okay. Which is cool as hell. Okay, okay. And, I mean, obviously they're older. I didn't no. get, I couldn't find where the age was, but older. See, I'm going into a flight simulator and you're an Air Force pilot. I'm doing dog fights. I'm, yes, I you am, are. I am shooting everything I can. Yeah, Whereas yeah. if you say you're being a, what, it's going to be a commercial airline pilot. The other group were told the simulator was broken and that they should just pretend to fly the plane. What a letdown. Get in the simulator. Okay. Brum, brum. Why, why am waka, I pretending waka, waka. to fly the plane when the simulator is broken? Because they probably had, you know. I don't understand conditions. how this is a, a condition for psych research. Okay, we, we're testing how few people feel about broken yeah. simulators. Yeah. That they're still asked to pretend to use. But um, apparently afterwards they did an eyesight test. Mm. The group that piloted the flight performed 40% better than the other group. So the eyesight allegedly improved. Oh, okay. Langer thought, okay, if there's a certain kind of prompt that could change vision, there was no reason that you couldn't try and change almost anything. And she says, clearly, mindset manipulation can counteract presumed physiological limits. And her end game is basically return the control of health back to ourselves. Yeah, okay. So we get to 2014. She plans to do a, a version of the monastery study, but three groups of women, 24 of them, with stage four breast cancer. Oh, okay. I know. That was my response too. Like, are you sure? Uh, they're in a stable condition and they're undergoing hormonal therapy. So okay. all the same for that stage four, which is- So it's pretty not bad, great, pretty not bad. Yeah. Pro- progno- are they like terminal or is this like- They didn't say terminal, no, but definitely, you know, they're at an advanced stage. Yeah. So, you know, things are, things are chugging along with difficulty. So two of the groups were to gather at a resort in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico under the supervision of Langer and her staff. You had me at resort. I know. In Mexico, two to go there, and an exper- the experimental group would live for a week in the surroundings that evoke the date two thousand and three, which was when they were, all the women were healthy and hopeful without any kind of mortal threat. Again, how far back did we go? Only this this wood is only planned eleven years back. It would be, but it was basically as long as you're before. Yeah, that okay. might be just dictated by the people. Two thousand and three is not a great year, was it? I, I don't know. I'm what still, stands out for it's you? It's not like a, I'm, I'm just saying. I want a bit of selection in the year I'm time traveling back to, not you're, just some random ninety six when the offspring were killing it. I, no, probably not. I, I don't know. I, I I don't know, but it seems a little bit weird. Do you want, do you want to hit pause? You can go away and work it out. You can look at a calendar and go mm, ninety one. Right. Tell me more. They were told to try and inhabit their former selves. So there were very few clues of the present day inside the resort. Nothing was particularly visible. In the living areas, it was turn of the millennium magazines. DVDs like Titanic and The Big Lebowski were lying around. So oh, God. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> I like The Big Lebowski. I know I'm not allowed to because you don't like the PTSD, but I still love it. No, but it's, it's just aged badly. They were intended to pass a richly diverting week. So art classes, cooking classes, writing classes, etc., to help distract them from, you know, what they're going, what's going on in their everyday real lives. The other group would be at the resort as well and they'd have support of fellow cancer patients but not live in the past. So just... You hang out in a nice place, talk to people who also understand work sure. through what you work through. The control group, nothing. You, would you stay home? Yeah, just keep doing what you do. All right. Now, you'd be amazed to hear there are many ethics hurdles to pass for this study, I, and I'm shocked. Stage four, I mean, of course there's uh, there's ethical considerations here. It's, yeah. all, it's medical research, yeah. but you are people that are stage four that uh, – your treatment is not necessarily likely to make anything worse here. I can't imagine that thinking you're back to another time is going to make things worse. I, I wouldn't imagine either, but yes, there was there was a lot. I didn't go into all the ethics stuff because there were a lot of hurdles and stages. But yeah. what I did record, I like, the one that pissed Langer off the most was uh, University of Southern California Ethics Board or what do they call them, Institutional Review Boards, asked that language be tweaked. They want me to add a consent form for the people to sign saying there's no known benefit to them but that just introduces a nocebo effect. So she's like, if if you force that, that's actually having an experimental you know, effect potentially yeah, on the whole procedure. Saying there's no known benefit. Yeah. I want you to sign it acknowledging there is no known benefit. And so she was a bit peeved about that. Is one. that required of placebo versus placebo tests? If we're- Not that I'm aware. So, uh, Usually you should be able to talk to people 
afterwards and say, okay, you're in the control group, et cetera. Yeah. If there's any results, you offer the treatment to the yeah. control group. So breast and other cancer, breast cancer and other cancer experts said, look, there's strong evidence that support the support of people boosts quality of life for cancer patients. So no surprise there, good social mm. systems and so forth. But there's less evidence it improves their health prospects. And one guy called Debu Tripathi, Tripathi, He's a breast cancer specialist and he had some sort of connection with the original proposal. He's, he's still got these credentials. He says, look, there are many examples in medicine where improvement in emotional states also bring about improvement in disease states. Mm. Many examples. And we know, for example, Tibetan monks can meditate, lower their blood pressure, people with hypertension, and they embark on behavioral changes. You'll see medical indexes drop, fewer heart attacks, etc. He says, but cancer, that's, as he puts it, a harder thing to fathom. But as far as I could tell and I looked, I don't think the study went ahead. Ah, if it did, it's well, me, it's I, well hidden. I wanted a result. You don't. Ah, it's well hidden. I wanted to know exists. if it improved your well, yeah, your cancer or your feelings. So Langer is now seventy six. She looks pretty good. She looks pretty well. She's always been into this positive psychology and mindfulness. That's been her shtick running all the way through, and it works for her. But look, she's she's still known to this day and continues to be known as the mother of positive psychology. Martin Seligman, I think, was the father, but they're not actually entwined. They didn't have a baby. Okay. It's just, you know, figurative. Two separate parents. Yeah, I don't want it to seem yeah. like they're actually having the yeah, intercourse. It's or, fine. Because I don't think they are. They might be, and if you are, good luck. And the closing quote from her, which I like, is, the power of the mind is likely not limitless, but we just don't know where those limits are. There's a whole movement now. I haven't actually uh, looked into that. I've, 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 I've heard people story. There's centers around the world doing narrative medicine, getting doctors to be better able to engage with people's stories, to hear people's stories, and then to help yeah. people tell their stories and things like that. And apparently, you know, maybe it's this research, maybe it's not. I haven't, I haven't looked into it, but um, apparently, it's a really growing area of medicine in a whole bunch of areas. Maybe she's just the start of it. Maybe it's yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is what I think is interesting about this because I mean, as you were picking up very early, it's like how much of it was people just going, "Oh, that we know that doesn't work." Like, no, as if instead of saying, "Let's just check the evidence and yeah. see." Because that, I can imagine being very real. People going, oh, bullshit. If it's not a chemical, how could it be changing you? I, I, it, feels, it feels really outdated to be railing against the idea of giving something people that make, make them feel nice and uh, yeah. give them a positive psychology. I don't see why that's a problem. No. And it feels really outdated to say, no, it's just got to be chemistry and that's the only thing we can look at. Yeah. I, I and feel it's not like, like she said, you guys coming into the monastery, for example, leave all your medication behind. Like It wasn't this and nothing else. No. It wasn't like we're going to lie to you, this will definitely work. But that Look, was, people did get angry about that. So you said, you said to them beforehand, this is likely to make you feel better. I think the interesting thing here, and it goes back to stuff we've talked about in the past, is that uh, understanding what the placebo effect is, uh, is is a big fascinating quest huge. in psychology and medicine and what is actually going on there. Because we know – you know, you take a sugar pill and it will have effects on your whatever the whatever the treatment, the condition is that you're suffering. And sometimes even if you're told this is a placebo, take this placebo, and yet there are still in some cases improvements. Registered. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so so there's something going on there. And yeah. I think actually understanding the placebo not as the, you know, the control condition where, you know, we're trying to get rid of that, but to say yeah. what actually is the placebo. And it feels like this kind of research is pushing in the direction so that we can understand that link. And I think that's a really fascinating thing to do. It's also the, the one that's always gotten to me ever since I started doing psych a hundred years ago was the idea that we seem to implicitly accept much more easily, oh, you're worrying will make you sick. Stress will make you unwell. All yeah. these like nocebo effects we seem to, like we embrace in culture, our cultures very easily. But the moment you say, oh, thinking more positively, et cetera, can make you better. Oh, no, that's woo-woo hippie shit and it's got no evidence. Well, that's just one guy saying this. Three guys. Well, three guys. You know, what do they Eight know? Eight guys. Whatever. No, I don't mean it's... here. I mean in general I notice this. Like uh, it, I feel like it's easier for people in our world to accept that negative thoughts and bad situations look, make look, you sick. Look, look, and there's clearly, clearly the there's people at the other end that are um, uh, thinking positive thoughts all the way into their grave. Uh, when, yeah. when they're not doing, positive, I'm going to die. Well, no, in the sense of we know people like Steve Jobs, for example, uh, yeah. followed a fair few treatments that are not recommended by yeah. uh, by most doctors uh, for his cancer, and uh, he didn't do terribly well out of that. Nope. And I feel like there there is a danger of people thinking positive thoughts and thinking that will get rid of the problem. Yeah. But I think some version of positive thinking or sort of narrative thinking might well. It, uh, help alongside other traditional mm. sorts of treatments. So Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff that suggests we are much more hardwired to 
like expect bad or at least not expect good than we are to expect good. So it would be harder also to instill an enduring positive mindset in a normal life. Well, this is my solution to live forever is – is Enduring uh, positive mindset. Well, no, this is, this is the um, – what is it? People who are happier are better able to lie to themselves. Uh, <laughs> because you're able to ignore all of the no, I'm fine. <laughs> all of the actual stu- totally uh, actual fine. terrible things in your life or the actual terrible person that you are. But you can you can just go, no, not me. I can, I'd rather I can lie that because I'm the worst. It's like oh, there's something there's a weird dot on my skin. Well I've got everything cancer. <laughs> I'd rather be that one. See, well this is me. Yeah, this yours is, is me. better. Well, welcome to my world where nothing is wrong. It's and all I'll, fine. Just, I'll just fall over dead one time, but you'll be happy right up till that moment 